Welcome to the Holy Heroes Podcast. I'm Clara, the host of the show. Tune in each week and help us bring the joy and wonder of the faith to your family. Each episode will be filled with fun and inspirational stories, music, and more for kids, plus a bonus segment at the end for parents. And don't worry, we always have plenty of additional resources at holyheroesfun.com. Welcome back to another episode full of animals. If you missed the last two episodes, make sure you go back and listen, because this month we are talking about animals who have helped saints, appeared in the Bible, and highlighted the magnificence of God's plan for the world. If you have been enjoying these animal episodes, can you leave a quick review? We love hearing what people think of the show. This week, we are hearing a story from the life of St. Anthony. Yes, get ready to hear another glory story. Then we are hearing the rest of the story of St. Jerome that we started last week. Then we are going to hear how animals can recognize that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist with an incredible story. And then we're back with another scriptural decade of the rosary. I know we've had some requests to bring these back, so make sure you pray along with us. Finally, moms, stick around to the end for something especially for you. Thank you to Prayer Pillowcases for sponsoring today's episode. Imagine falling asleep each night alongside your favorite saint or angel. You can do just that with prayer pillowcases, which feature a huge collection of saints, guardian angel images, and beautiful prayers printed on quality pillowcases. Everyone has a pillow, so make it Catholic. Go to holyheroes.com slash pillow to find your child's patron saint on a pillow. Just go to holyheroes.com slash pillow and discover saints like St. Anthony, St. Martin de Pours, Blessed Carlo Acutis, and so much more. Now, on to the rest of the show. Last week, we heard about St. Anthony preaching to the fish when no one would listen. Well, that wasn't the only time St. Anthony used animals to help bring people to Christ. Listen in to this week's Glory Story segment. Many whose souls had been lost turned away from their heresy, came to confession, and returned to the sacraments of the church. But one man in particular was not entirely convinced. Signore, may I come in? Of course, Father. But what would a priest want in a saddlemaker's shop? Mm, My friend, I understand you have lost something. What? What are you talking about? Your friends tell me you have lost something very important. I do not know what they mean. I have, I have lost, I have lost nothing. My friend, I have come to speak to you about returning to the sacrament of our Lord's body and blood. Ah, I can accept nearly all you and the church teach, Father, but I cannot accept the Eucharist. Who can listen to that? How can Jesus give us his flesh to eat? How can God himself be in a bit of bread or a cup of wine? Impossible. Hmm. Your words are like those of his followers that day by the Sea of Tiberias. You see, my friend, anything is possible with God. Remember, our Lord said, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And then, at the Last Supper, Waste he told no them, more of your preaching on me. I've seen the Eucharist when I go to Mass. It looks like bread. It smells like bread. It is bread. Why, even my horse would know that. And if your horse recognized otherwise? What are you proposing? I am proposing, Signore, that we conduct a little experiment. Go on. You say that even your horse would know if the sacred hosts were nothing more than bread, yes? Of course. He eats everything in sight. If there's a scrap of food anywhere, he'll find it. Well, Signore, I propose that you do not feed your horse for three days, and then bring him along with some hay and oats to the town square. I will bring our Lord present in the Blessed Sacrament. We will see what happens. So it was done. After three days at the appointed time, leading a large brown horse, the man arrived at the town square and pushed his way through the growing crowd. The horse was wild-eyed with hunger. The townspeople cleared a space in the center of the square, and the man placed the oats and the hay on large plates. 
As the bell rang, the crowd parted, and St. Anthony arrived holding the sacred host high above him. The crowd grew silent as all eyes turned from the blessed sacrament to the man and his horse. Slowly, he released his grip on the bridle and let the animal go. Cautiously, the horse approached the plate filled with oats. Lowering his head, he sniffed them, and after a brief moment, raised his head and backed away. Then he moved to the next plate. In the same way, the huge horse who was clearly starving ignored the hay. Then slowly, the great animal approached Father Anthony, who was holding the sacred host in his consecrated hands. To the amazement of all, the horse bowed his head and with great effort, bent his front legs and knelt before the Eucharist. It rose only when Anthony gave it permission. The man returned to the sacraments and so did his entire household. Many lost souls were saved that day. St. Anthony was so well known for his preaching and teaching that he is now a doctor of the church. No, not like a doctor you see when you're sick. But a doctor of the church is a man or woman whose teachings or writings had such an immense impact on the theology of the church that we give them the special title of doctor. Sort of like when you go to college and you learn from a professor and you call him Dr. Flemings or something like that. We give that title to people in the church who are incredible teachers. That's not the only interesting thing about St. Anthony, though. After he died, part of his body remained incorrupt, which means it didn't decay. Can you guess which part of his body you can still see today in Italy? His hands. Oh, almost. It's actually his tongue. Because he was such an amazing preacher, God preserved St. Anthony's tongue and left it incorrupt so that everyone could see it even hundreds of years after his death. My brother just visited Padua, Italy a few weeks ago and was able to see this tongue of St. Anthony, his confirmation saint. Maybe one day you'll go to Padua, Italy and see his tongue too. Now, if you want to hear the rest of the St. Anthony glory story, head over to holyheroesfun.com and you can download the complete story there. St. Anthony has an incredible life that a lot of people don't know about. So make sure you head over to holyheroesfun.com and download the rest of the St. Anthony glory story. Last week, we started the story of St. Jerome. So we are going to continue it in this week's segment of Saints and Animals. Remember what I told you last time about the lion, the donkey, and the monks who lived with St. Jerome in Jerusalem? St. Jerome had helped heal the lion's hurt paw. The lion had helped the monks protect the donkey. But one time, the lion came home without the donkey. The monks had thought he must have eaten the donkey, but they did not find the donkey's bones anywhere. The lion couldn't tell them what had really happened and the monks gave the lion the donkey's work of dragging firewood. Now, one day, while the lion was out in the woods, he climbed a hill he had not climbed before. The hill overlooked one of the main roads. On this road, there were men, oil merchants, heavily laden camels, and a donkey traveling. Could it be? The lion went out to meet them. Recognizing the donkey as his friend, he let out a great roar and charged at the merchants, not intending to hurt them, but only to scare them away. And were they scared? Those merchants ran off as fast as their legs could carry them, so fast, in fact, that they forgot all about their camels and the donkey, which they had stolen while the lion was sleeping. The donkey was grateful to return to his old friends, the monks. With the donkey in the lead, the camels following, and the lion bringing up the end of the line, all the animals traveled back to the monastery. The monks were astounded. Not only was their donkey safe and sound, but here was a caravan of camels to greet them as well. They ran to tell Jerome. Open the gates, brothers, Jerome said, and take the loads off these guests, the camels, and be prepared for their rightful owners to come as well. Set the table and prepare some food for them. 
Yes, Father Jerome. Of course, Father. Right away, Father Jerome. While these instructions were carried out, the lion resumed his usual quiet tameness around the monks, wagging his tail and lying down at the feet of the brothers. Behold, the lion had done no wrong, they said to one another. He didn't eat our donkey after all. The donkey was only lost. Later that evening, the merchants came, begging Jerome's forgiveness for stealing the donkey. We are so sorry, they said. Will you take half of our oil for your chapel, an amendment for our crime? That would not be right for us, Jerome said. How can we take half of your goods when you need it more than us? Oh, but we do not need it, the merchants said. We are sure now that we went down to Egypt to bargain for oil, not for our sakes, but for yours. Please take it. So Jerome agreed, and he gave the merchants a light, refreshing meal and blessed them for their journey home. And everyone rejoiced that night. The monks, the merchants, the camels, the donkey, but most of all, the lion. Don't worry, we're not done hearing about animals yet. Listen to this week's Miracles, Mysteries, and Wonders. Today's Miracles, Mysteries, and Wonders true story took place in the United States of America, and it's another one with a dog in it. My family has a dog. Maybe you do, too. Ruthie is our little dog, and all she really does is play and sit with you every time you sit down anywhere. There are lots of different breeds of dogs, some of which are called working dogs. These working dogs are specially trained for specific tasks. Some are trained for herding sheep, like collies and Shetland sheepdogs. Some are trained as guard dogs, like Rottweilers and Doberman Pinschers. And some dogs are trained to help the police find things that are hidden. How do the dogs do this? By using their excellent sense of smell. So these dogs are sometimes called sniffer dogs. That sounds kind of funny, but they really are able to find hidden things just by sniffing. They can find drugs and bombs and all sorts of things, depending on what they are trained to sniff for. Today I want to tell you about some specially trained sniffer dogs. In 1995, Pope St. John Paul II was visiting the United States. On the last day of this visit, he was scheduled to greet a group of seminarians at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, Maryland. The original plan was for the Pope to meet with the seminarians outside on the steps of the church. However, when he arrived, he insisted upon going inside to pray in the chapel. Those in charge of keeping the Pope safe now had to make sure that no one was hiding inside the seminary. So they began to search with sniffer dogs specially trained to find people. When these dogs smell a person, they're trained to whine and growl and look in the direction of anyone they find. They will not leave the area until their handlers get the person out or give the dogs commands that it is okay to leave. These dogs went sniffing through the halls and classrooms of the seminary. They smelled no one. Every office they entered, every room, they smelled no one. Everything seemed clear and safe for the Pope. The only room left to search was the chapel itself. They entered the chapel and began moving down the aisle, carefully checking the pews. Suddenly, all the dogs began to whine and refused to leave the chapel. The security team looked everywhere, but they could find no one hiding. Can you guess where the sniffer dogs were looking? That's right, they were all looking right at the tabernacle. The dogs could sense that a real person was in that tabernacle. No, not an intruder hiding, but it was Jesus 
in the Holy Eucharist. In fact, that's why Pope St. John Paul II wanted to go pray in the chapel, because he knew, like all Catholics do, that Jesus himself is there inside every tabernacle in the whole world. That reminds me of something. Did you know that St. Francisco Marto, one of the child saints of Fatima, would often go to spend time with the hidden Jesus every day? St. Francisco called Jesus in every tabernacle the hidden Jesus, and he would always stop by the church to pray to him. You can visit Jesus in the tabernacle too, and when you do, think of how Jesus is hidden inside, but we know, just like those sniffer dogs did, that he is truly there, waiting all the time, every day, for anyone who wants to stop by to talk to him. amazing that even a horse and a dog can recognize Jesus's true presence in the Eucharist? Next time you go to Mass, make sure you genuflect very carefully and say a special prayer when you see the priest raise the Eucharist up. Just think, Jesus is truly there and you can talk to him. Another thing you can think about during Mass is Psalm 34.8. We have Catholic Songs for Kids here today to sing Psalm 34.8 for us. Listen in and see if you can sing along. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Oh, taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge. Now, we've heard a story about a donkey today, so I thought it was only fitting that we pray a mystery of the rosary where a donkey was present. We are praying the third joyful mystery, the nativity. The third joyful mystery, the nativity, Jesus is born. This mystery begins to reveal that Jesus will have a more difficult life than Mary and Joseph might have expected God would want for his son. First, Mary and Joseph had to make a hard journey to Bethlehem to obey the law of Caesar. They still probably thought that God would provide a nice place for his son to be born, but the only place anyone would give them was a stable. It was probably quite another surprise when the shepherds arrived at the manger, talking about the angels. Mary and Joseph had been told about Jesus by angels too, so all of the people who saw Jesus, the Messiah of the Jews, at his birth were invited there by angels. But the message of the angels to the shepherds was that Jesus was sent to more than just the Jewish people. Just like you and me today, Our Lady thought about these things, trying to understand. And the mystery ends with St. Joseph obeying what the angels had told him and Mary to do, naming the Messiah, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 
In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in the manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is thee. Blessed thou, woman, and blessed in whom Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. And in that region there were shepherds out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy world, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. And this shall be a sign for you, You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of goodwill. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. When the angels departed from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. And they went with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw him, they made known the saying, which had been told them concerning this child. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed is thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, will grow without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, and save us from the fires of hell. Thanks for praying with us. Now, moms, this part of the segment is for you. And I'm just going to give you a moment now if you want to plug in your earbuds or pause this to little kids aren't walking around just because there are a few words we might say that their ears are not quite ready for. All 
All right. Now that that's out of the way, I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about the good pictures, bad pictures, picture books. I know we talked about this a few weeks ago, but we had a few questions from people just asking what ages this is appropriate for and why these picture books are so important. Why is everyone talking about them? Matt Frad talks about them. So many other Catholic leaders talk about the importance of these good pictures, bad pictures, porn proofing today's young kids. So let me just give you a few reasons why this book is incredibly important and helpful to Catholic parents. So number one, this picture book is appropriate for children who have not yet received the talk. Pornography is very prevalent. However, these books do not actually use the word pornography. Instead, they talk about ways of identifying bad pictures, different ways of what? show parts of the body that should be covered with a swimsuit. They also talk about kind of the gut reaction kids will experience when they see this. It doesn't focus on, you know, hurting their innocence, trying to explain to them what pornography is. It keeps it very brief and just says this is a bad picture. So it's appropriate for kids who have not yet received the talk. The second thing that makes this book super important is that it helps build open communication between parents and children. I know my interview a few weeks ago with Layla Miller, where she talked about her book, Raising Chase Catholic Men. This was something she really focused on, this open communication in the younger years to help set you up for a good relationship in the teen years when topics do get a lot scarier and a lot more serious. The third thing is it teaches from a non-religious perspective. Now, you're probably thinking, as a Catholic parent, um, I want this from a religious perspective. That's really true. But the reality with pornography is that the issues with it aren't just religious. There's real science behind this that shows that it is addictive, it is unhealthy for you, and it's just bad for your brain. So this book will focus on how your brain works, and it will help kids realize that this is not a healthy addiction to get into and will give them information that they can then use to make informed decisions and avoid this in the future. Then most importantly, it gives your child a plan to follow when they encounter pornography. Now, when most kids encounter pornography, they're really young. I mean, the ages that this is impacting is shocking how young this is. And we don't like to think about that. But the reality is it is just more and more prevalent. So what Good Pictures, Bad Pictures does is it gives steps for what to do if you see a bad picture. Again, these books are gentle ways, especially the junior version. There's two versions of Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. The junior version is even more gentle, but also gives steps so that kids know if they see a bad picture, they know exactly what to do, which spoiler alert, involves immediately going and finding you and telling you which is so important. Again, back to that open communication thing. You want your kids to tell you if they see this. So reading good pictures, bad pictures together before they come across this is a great way to equip and empower them so they just do not fall victim to this incredibly dangerous aspect of our society today. So if you do not have good pictures, bad pictures in your home yet, I'm gonna make sure Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, and the junior version are both linked over at holyheroesfund.com. I cannot stress enough how important it is for every Catholic home to have this book available to talk about a really tough topic with your young kids. Thanks for listening to the Holy Heroes Podcast. Make sure you subscribe and tell your friends to listen in. All of the resources, printables, and more can be found at holyheroesfund.com. Make sure you tune in next week, and I can't wait to see you in heaven.